A web novel author dies a pathetic death while reading hate comments on his latest web novel. He meets agent of Hell's Soul Management Department, Rim Reaper Kim, standing in front of his lying body. The agent tells him the reason of death was cardiac arrest due to a sudden heart attack from a surge in blood pressure. Being already in shock, he was forced to make a strange decision as when someone dies, in order to go to heaven, they need to atone for the major sins they've committed. The sins, our novelist committed were quitting multiple serializations and writing stories with terrible continuity. In short, he was irresponsible and frequently dropped his series. So, as an irresponsible novelist, he had to atone by reincarnating into his one of the completed novels and survive until the end. But, in all the novels he had wrote had very bad endings, that is the main character always died in the ending. At last, he chose The Demon King is Dead, a relatively refreshing novel he wrote after writing many depressing novels. The Demon King is Dead is set in a fantasy background. He chose it since it was a sweet slice of life academy story set after a war. It's a novel where the final boss dies at the start of the story. After choosing the novel, he is reincarnated as a lowest grade demon king of the race arc demon, having two horns on his head. He finds himself in an extravagant place and suddenly opened his status menu. His name is Valier Jr. After knowing that he is a demon king, he feels depressed as the title of the novel was The Demon King is Dead. I feel sad for novelists. Anyway, let's go into the story. He found himself in the midst of the demon realm being blown to peace. He hears a sound and sees an explosion, which sends him back flying. A pop-up window appeared stating prologue event, ruination triggered. He is given the task to survive and to escape the Demon King's castle, and the reward for this task will be 100 achievement points. He sees a corpse of a demon in front of him, which terrorized him more. Furthermore, he immediately backed from the place and ran in the hallway cursing Grim Reaper, calling her a scammer. He exactly knew the reason why Castle was blowing up, that is the Demon King and the hero were in the middle of their final battle and also knew what the outcome will be as he was the writer of it. The outcome was that the Demon King and Hero both meet their end in this final battle and the war ends with humans' victory, the MC thought in his mind as he was the Demon Prince, the moment he got caught, he would certainly die. He again looked towards his stats and knew that his stats can't be considered as great. He didn't have any special abilities to survive or escape. The only good thing he has is that he can read the letters of this world. Thinking of finding something good, he went into Demon Castle's warehouse, only to find a piece of junk and trash. That's why the Demon Army was losing to the Imperial Army. Out of nowhere, he suddenly found a magic scroll book which had a teleportation scroll. But to no avail, he couldn't use it due to the magic barrier. He lost his hope to survive, and the page of the book flipped and turned to a camouflage scroll page. A status screen appeared stating camouflage, the user can change their appearance and disguise themselves as something else. He disguised himself as a human prisoner and planned to get mixed with humans in prison then get saved by the Imperial Army along with other prisoners and, finally, find an opportunity to run away. Mission success, being saved by the human army, is the best way for him to survive this situation. He immediately went to the human prison. Why is it so quiet? He smelled something like fish. No, it smelled like blood. He stepped on something and shouted to find it was a human flesh, a human hand. He found many bodies lying in front of him. Are they all dead? He never wrote something like this in his novel. It was supposed to be a rom-com novel. He couldn't also leave the room, as he had no other choice. Suddenly, there was a girl covered in blood in front of him sitting next to a body, the only survivor in that room. He went straight to her and asked how she was. Valier told him that he was also a prisoner there. Valier sat beside her to wait for the Imperial force to rescue them. Valier told the girl that he was also afraid that, after all, it was a demon king's castle. Valier offered the wafers to the girl he had in the pocket of the clothes he was wearing originally and kept it. Suddenly they heard a voice, I found the prison cells. The Imperial Army had reached the prison cell. One of the men from the Imperial Army said, please punish me for not saving you sooner. And called the girl, your Imperial Highness. This shocked Valier. Later, we got to know the name of the girl, Charlotte de Guardias, Guardias Empire's first imperial princess. 
Suddenly a window popped up, prologue event, ruination clear. You have acquired 100 achievement points. This marks the end of the second chapter of the Manwa. Velier was saved alongside the princess by imperial forces. They were taken to the Imperial Army Field military camp situated at a closer distance to Demon King's castle. Velier and the princess were served lunch in the camp. The princess was taking too much care of Velier, giving too much attention to him would result in difficulty in running away. The princess was a character which did not appear in the novel as she was killed in the Demon King's castle. Lance was taking care of princess and of Velier too as he was savior of the princess. Princess was to be taken back to the Imperial Palace as soon as Duke Salerian would arrive. Princess thanked Valier for taking care of her in the prison. But Valier didn't do anything particularly and wondered the same. Even then, he was a great help to the princess. In return, Princess would make sure to get him returned to his hometown and asked for his hometown. Valier being Demon King did not have a hometown and told the princess that he couldn't remember anything about it. And due to this, the lad stared at him as if he was going to kill him just for answering slowly. Princess felt sorry for him and believed him for his words thinking that he must have gone through a lot. Valier thinks of her being naive. Princess promised him to help him recover his memories. Valier thanked her and thought that her intentions were good, but it can't be impossible to be kept as the princess was going to die. There was no character of her in the novel so he deduced that she would be killed as knowing Prince Petrus, her brother would never let competition live if it stood in the ease of his succession to the throne. This innocent girl does not even know of her own fate. Even Valier could not do anything as he was powerless. And also deduced that being her acquaintance, his own life was also in danger. He wanted to tell her about her life being in danger and if he could get her on his side, it will be of some help. The princess told Lance of having little indigestion from eating too much and told Lance to get a doctor to treat her. After Lance went out, face of the princess changed. The princess became a different person from what she was earlier. She immediately asked Valier for an apology as his life would be in danger. She already knew about the scheming. This shocked Valier as he didn't know about this. According to the princess, there was a high possibility that she would be assassinated in the near future if things continue as they were. She deduced the culprit being her step-sibling, Bertus de Gradia. Most of the people in the camp were probably enemies. And the fact they were keeping her there without letting her go outside proves the same. She was even covered with a thick coat when she was being rescued. People outside were probably waiting on orders about how to get rid of them. They might poison her and tell everyone that they found her dead in the Demon King's castle. And if she died like that, they wouldn't let Valier let go either. He would be quietly killed to get rid of all the evidence. Valier asked the princess to ask for help from some knights. She answered him that it would be of no use and they can't trust anyone here. She told him they are going to be out of here. She made a plan that will make a divergence for Valier to run and get Sir Francis. Sir Francis only could save them as he was the same knight who rescued them from Demon King's castle. He is one of the rare people in the neutral faction who is only loyal to the imperial family itself and won't harm her. He could be trusted by them to get out of this camp. Valier questioned her if Sir Francis could really be trusted. But, if that was the case then they would have already died in the Demon King's castle. Sir Francis was an excellent knight who was unwaveringly loyal to the Imperial family and would not harm anyone from the Imperial family. Valier understood and agreed on the plan thinking of this as an only chance which would help them to survive. The princess acted as bait to allow Valier to run from there. She wished to see the barracks to the knights standing outside of their tent. But they could not do it. In the meantime, Valier ran from the back of the tent only to find a red-haired knight on his way. The knight stopped him and questioned what he was doing there. Valier replied that he was looking for Sir Francis. The knight told him that he had already left for Demon King's castle. Valier was shocked on hearing this and questioned the knight if this was true. Their plan was now screwed. According to the knight, Sir Lance, a member of the military headquarters requested to take care of the remnants in the Demon King's castle. Lance had already predicted her plans and made a move. Knight questioned him about the business he had with Sir Francis. 
Valier had no choice but to tell the knight the truth about what was going on. The knight agreed on saving them as Valier was stupidly desperate and the knight was a junior to Sir Francis himself. He thought of going immediately to rescue him as Sir Francis' life was in danger. The knight has the gut feeling that Sir Francis already predicted that this would happen and entrusted him to stand by. And also warned him that someone might come. Valier was shocked as he had not known that Sir Francis already predicted this. Lance was hearing all this behind a wall but did not take any action. The knight asked Valier if had ridden a horse earlier. If not, the knight's steed was excellent and would be able to hold two without a problem. They got on horse and moved toward the demon castle. And we got to know the name of the knight was Dyrus. Valier on their way saw leftover demons, they were getting locked in a cage. And wondered why there were demons there. He asked Dyrus why there were demons on the roadside. Dyrus further answered that they were demon prisoners. Had he forgotten that there was just a battle here? If they were captured here, then they're either defeated soldiers or non combatants. They were still investigating and looking into areas near the Demon King's castle. Once they arrive back at headquarters, they'll all be executed. This worried Valier as he was himself a demon, furthermore, a demon king. They reached the Demon Castle investigation camp. Two knights stopped them and asked for their identities. Dyrus salutes and introduces himself as Lieutenant Dyrus, platoon leader of the 11th Squadron's 3rd platoon in the 1st Corps 4th Cavalry Regiment. The knights further asked him what brought them there. Lieutenant Dyrus told them that this boy here had something important to tell Sir Francis, so he had brought him there. The knight feared and asked them if they had said Sir Francis? He further told them that they just received a report that S.I.R. Francis had died in battle with demon remnants. Sir Francis was killed by demons. Valier was shocked on hearing this. Now, they had no one who would help them. Prince Bertus wants to hide the fact that the princess survived and thus wanted to kill her. And so in order to do that he would also want to get rid of all the evidence. Even if that means killing everyone which included Sir Francis. And therefore, Sir Francis was lured to the castle and was killed rather than dying in battle with the demons. The camp knight asked if there was a message but Dyrus told him it was just some personal thing that they needed to tell Sir Francis. The knight told them to go back as this place was not for outsiders and the camp knight went back. As Dyrus was part of Francis' group, he wanted to help Princess at any cost. There was nothing left for them to do at the Demon King's castle as Sir Fronick was dead but Valier had other plans. He stopped Dyrus from going back and told him that he had a good plan. The idea was to look through the demon supplies for items that could aid them in the escape. On reaching the supply room, Dyrus found that someone had already looted the room. We already know the culprit from the earlier chapters, the demon king Valier himself. They searched the entire room. Valier had found a mass teleportation scroll and by using it they could teleport anywhere. Valier picked a bunch of scrolls thinking they might be useful later. Valier had also found a scroll book where they could put all the scrolls and have easy access to them. Valier found too many items which brought suspicions to Dyrus as he was unable to find a single item whereas Valier found so many without going through many places. Dyrus had heard that Valier was a prisoner but how on earth did he know the location of all the scrolls? He didn't question him as it was not a good place. They came out of the room. Dyrus asked Valier if he remembered the way they came through, Valier answered affirmative and told the directions. But suddenly Dyrus heard something and told Valier to stop. Valier and Dyrus hid behind a statue, there were some knights searching for them. They were knights of the Silurian Duchy, Bertus maternal family power and one of the strongest noble families of the empire. They want to enthrone Bertus as the emperor. Because of that, most of the knights that make up the Silurian Duchy are no ordinary knights or of common origin. They're high-ranking knights of noble status. One of the knights thought that they might run away within this spacious castle, it would be a pain to find them. Another knight told him not to worry, he used magic through his eyes and immediately found Valier and Dyrus. Other knights listening carefully found someone breathing heavily. This concerned Valier very much. How could they find them in an instant? The knight now knew their exact location and pulled out his sword and asked them to come out obediently. Valier and Dyrus came out. 
One of the knights cursed the princess on making innocent people die alongside herself. This made Dyrus angry, and called the knight a disgrace on trying to lay a hand on the princess' life. But it doesn't matter to the knight. Knight doesn't feel good to kill a young civilian, but it was for the future of the empire. Lieutenant Dyrus took charge of the situation and told Valier to stay back. Valier was already in fear as he went through all the trouble to run away from the castle, but in the end he was going to die in the same castle. He had already died from high blood pressure a day ago. Suddenly, he found a stone gargoyle statue. Valier thought in comics and games, they'll usually start moving during times like this. And suddenly it started moving. All night trembled on looking over the moving statue. This bought time for Valier and Dyrus to run away as this was their chance. They ran from the place while the gargoyle statue was only attacking the knight. They ran away on their horse. While they were riding on it, Dyrus asked Valier why the statue protected them? Valier replied that he didn't know either. Well it was a lie as Valier had an ability called demon domination which resulted in commanding the statue which in turn protected them. Valier was pretty sure that he subconsciously woke it up with demon domination and hoped that Dyrus wouldn't suspect him because of it. But, Dyrus was glad that they were able to safely escape from a dying situation. But to their dismay, the knights were tailing them on their horse. There were many of them as compared to the previous knights. The distance between Dyrus' horse and the knight's horse was closing relatively faster. Valier told Dyrus to hold on his waist as he was going to use magic from demon scrolls to slow the tailing knights. He used haste spell to speed up their horse and move ahead they were able to create some distance. Dyrus couldn't believe that Valier knew acceleration magic and because of this the knights would be having a hard time catching them. But, the knights started using their crossbows and shoot it on them. They were not going to go easy on them. Dyrus asked Valier to stop playing around and hang on. Valier needed a more surefire way to get rid of Solyrian's knights. But the lieutenant told Valier that that magic won't work on knights who are well trained in riding horses. It was pointless. Valier knew this because it's the exact setting he used when he wrote the novel because knights dying from a single spell sounded ridiculous. He also wrote the temple's curriculum from where the knights are trained which included horse riding. So, he was not going to use it on the knights. Rather than using it on knights, he used that magic on a horse. The magic was illusion. Horse acted strangely and stopped chasing Valier and Dyrus. Valier was not certain that the magic worked on the horses. Next was to use charm magic on another horse and it stopped. Now he had to deal with the remaining two horses but to his dismay all mine magic scrolls were used and there was none left. And on top of it, the horse on which Valier and Dyrus were riding was already tired and was now moving at slow pace. Because of this, soon the Valerian knight would catch up to them. Valier suddenly saw surviving demons who were captured after the demon king's army lost. He felt a feeling. It was the same feeling from when he moved the gargoyle statue. He subconsciously again used demon domination. All the demons became violent and were ready to fight. The orc charged toward Valier and Dyrus, which frightened Dyrus and cursed on dying like this. But the orc passed by them and attacked the Solarian's knight, which bought time for Valier and Dyrus to run away from them. At last, they were able to run away successfully. But Dyrus wondered why they were getting help from demons whenever they were in danger. But it was still too soon to have suspicions. First, he needed to save Her Imperial Highness. They successfully reached the camp where the princess was. The knights who were guarding Imperial Princess Barracks stopped them and told them to reveal themselves. Dyrus stated he was Lieutenant Dyrus and he had something to report to Her Imperial Highness. The guard knight questioned his affiliation and how dare a mere lieutenant request to see her imperial highness? The guard knight told them that he will let it slide this once and so leave. Dyrus told Valier that it's time for plan B. Dyrus attacked the knights and got caught but he had created an opening for Valier to go inside the tent and save princess. On reaching inside, Valier found two old mans. Those old mans questioned Valier who he was and they were sure that they had said to not let anyone in. Princess recognized Valier. Valier told the princess to close her eyes and casted flash magic which stunned the eyes of both the old men. 
Valier called the princess to his side and used mass teleport scroll to teleport both of them to the imperial capital Guardium. This chapter ends with a notice screen that you have completed the prologue sequence. Special achievement achieved a historic turning point. An important character who wasn't alive in the original timeline Charlotte de Guardias has survived. The future has changed greatly. Valier had have acquired 1,000 achievement points. Valier and the princess reached the Imperial Capital Guardium, the stage where the main story of the The Demon King is Dead unfolds. Guardium was modeled after Seoul, where the novelist was born. Valier thought he'd be touched to arrive there, but he was dead shocked. There was no way he would have written about a massive city like it in detail. It was very detailed as compared to Valier designs. Well, it was not the time to be lost in author mode. The princess asked Valier what was going on. They were at the camp in the demon realm just a moment ago. But now suddenly they were in the imperial capital. This confused the princess. Valier apologized to the princess for bringing her to the capital without a proper explanation. He also told her about Sir Francis being dead. She deduced that they reached the capital through Valier's power. Valier denied it and stated that there was someone who helped them escape. Out of nowhere, Lieutenant Dyrus arrived at the same place through another teleportation scroll. Dyrus was at ease now as they got here safely. Valier asked Dyrus if he was injured. Dyrus was fine but if it was even a little bit later, he could have died there. Plan B was a backup plan that was created in case Dyrus and Valier failed to infiltrate because of the guards, the plan was that Dyrus would buy some time so that Valier could enter the tent and escape with the princess with the help of teleportation scroll. And after that Dyrus would use teleportation scroll and escape. They were lucky as they had found an extra teleportation scroll in the castle. Or else, Dyrus would have died. The princess asked Dyrus for his identity. Dyrus bowed in front of her. Lieutenant Dyrus was the platoon leader of the 11th Squadron's 3rd Platoon in the 1st Corps' 4th Cavalry Regiment. Dyrus gave Princess Charlotte a detailed report on everything that happened. From the death of Sir Francis, to infiltration of the Demon King's castle to how they almost died while being chased by Silurian's knights and also stopping of Silurian's knights by Gargoyle statue and also one of the Demon prisoners' rampage which bought them time to escape. Valier knew that it was super suspicious. The fact that he was the center of every solution makes it more fishy. It would be strange if the princess trusted him blindly as she was raised amidst the hellhole that is imperial politics. At last Valier made a decision to escape to an alley as his identity would eventually be exposed if he had stuck around the princess for too long. Valier had gone through many hardships to save the princess but he couldn't get the reward because he was a demon. On top of it, Valier was starving. If he'd known something like this would happen, he would have written in a convenient setting like a demon can sustain himself with only mana. Suddenly a pop-up appears stating utilizing ad settings. A demon can gain nutrition by expending mana. Said setting required 100,000 achievement points. Another notice popped up, now he had the authority to interfere in the world of the demon king is dead his actions now could change the main story. Additionally, he will be given achievement points as a reward for the events he will face. Another notice appeared, he could also gain achievements points by completing challenges. He is able to check currently active challenges. This list will be periodically refreshed. He checked the list only to find hellishly difficult quests which included Super slapping the Emperor's cheek. I feel pity for our protagonist. Anyways, let's go ahead with the story. As a reward for clearing the prologue event he had got a special ability to use achievements points. He could use points on revision and preview. He further got a warning that interfering with major events or main characters can be impossible or require a large amount of points. And using the skill in a way that can cause a setting collapse will make the activation fail and if attempted, there will be a penalty. A further notice arrived on which Valier told the system to summarize it into three sentences. The system exactly summarized all the notices and stated that he was now able to interfere with the world settings through the usage of achievements points. Second, major events might not be revisioned or might require a large amount of achievement points. Third, skill cannot be used to cause setting collapse. Attempts to force it will cause a penalty. 
The system showed him another notice and called him an idiot that doesn't like to read even though they're a writer. The system is totally MC as compared to Valier. Well, it seems like a good cheat ability to our protagonist through which could make it out alive. He went through more settings where he found Wright's advice which will cost him 150 points. There were two options to select. One was clear advice and the other was vague advice. To check both, first he clicked on vague advice where he found a riddle, he just had blown 150 important points. Next he chose clear advice where he is told to go to a magic item store. It told him to sustain himself by selling the magic scrolls he had. He went to Aligar district commerce area. He visited many shops to sell the scroll but to his dismay, everyone turned him down calling him a scammer. It was weird as the system told him to go to a magic item store. He was tired and hungry now. He went to the next shop. The shop owner thought of him as a good artist. So asked Valier to perfectly redraw the scroll. Shop owner further told him that he had some good drawing skills and thought of splitting the profit 50 to 50. If he drew it by tomorrow, shop owner would pay him five silver coins. Valier agreed on it but he had no plan to return to this shop. He just thought of reselling it to someone else. He finds it strange that people were not able to recognize the scrolls he got from the castle. He planned to go into a final shop, either he would sell the scroll or call it a day. He wasn't expecting much. He went inside the shop, but no one was there. The store was too messy which made Valier think that they were not open for business. Suddenly girl came out of nowhere and greeted Valier as a customer. She asked him what brought him here or either he wanted to buy a scroll or a potion. Valier wanted to sell the scroll. The girl told him that it is bad to pull pranks on an adult. The girl generally doesn't buy scrolls, but she can't either let him hang on to dangerous objects. She offered Valier two gold coins and took possession of it. She was astonished on seeing the scroll and asked Valier where he found it. She was angry and pressured Valier to tell the location. According to her, it was no ordinary scroll but a scroll written in demon language. In this world magic exists, but how it exists isn't even known to Valier. Valier didn't set settings on magic activation or the method in which it's triggered. Therefore, there was no way Valier would be able to differentiate a human magic from a demonic one with a single glance. That's why those merchants didn't know about demonic scrolls. They just thought of it as a screwed-up scroll. However this was not the case with this girl. This woman in front of Valier was able to see through it. She slammed her hands on the table. She wanted the answer of how he got that scroll. This made Valier fear her. Valier asked his notification window to make a story so that the girl won't make a big deal out of the scroll. But to his dismay, the said setting required 3000 achievement points which he could not afford. He cursed the notification window and the window then showed him a middle finger. I knew the system was too OP but it was something next level. On looking over this, the girl asked what he was doing. He feared the girl as he had to reveal it. So, he told that he took it from the Demon King's castle. But she did not believe it and was very furious over it. She threatened him to tell her the truth. Over this, Valier had to tell her everything. On listening to everything, the girl told him that he was lying. If he rescued the imperial princess, he would have received an incredible or an amazing title. Valier was not lying to her, it was the truth. He further said that there was a clash with the knights of the Silurian duchy during the escape which might end up killing him. Finally, the girl understood it was true. Valier was relieved to hear it. According to the girl, finally the demon king had passed on. It must have been tough for Valier to survive. She hugged Valier to put him at ease. The girl wanted to use the release curse over Valier thinking he might be having some sort of curse in the demon castle. But it worried Valier as his real identity would be revealed if she does it. She finally chanted dispel which removed the camouflage from Valier. She was shocked to look over to find him a demon. Valier was now in his true form, the demon king. Valier tried to come up with an excuse to get over it. But the girl bowed in front of him calling him your highness. Valier was shocked on seeing her bowing in front of him. 
Velier was totally clueless as he did not have memories of his previous self. The girl asked if he was unable to remember her. She chanted magic and revealed her true form. Velier was shocked on finding her, a vampire. She was a vampire who was infiltrating the imperial capital with two other demons for information. She further asked Velier if he doesn't remember her. They have to go inside as if they remained there, they might be discovered by other people. They moved to her room on the second floor to continue the conversation. Velier had no clue what was going on but still he followed her to her room. The vampire gave him food to eat. Velier thanked her for the food. She again asked if he really lost all his memories. Other than the fact that he was the demon prince, he didn't remember anything. It was very fortunate for both of them as Velier brought the demon scroll to her. She bowed and began to introduce herself to His Highness Velier. Her name was Elaris and she was a member of the Demon King Army's Guardian Infiltration Squad, Tuesday. She will serve him from now onwards. Velier did not write any setting like that. He further asked her if there was a reason for why a vampire was living in such a sunny place with so many people? She answered that she needed to live in a building with the store attached so that she could save on the rent. She had no choice. They were short on money. There was something more Valier needed to know. Elaris told him that there were two other demons in the Imperial capital. One member is active under the false identity of Count Argon Pontheus, Sarkar, a dread fiend. The other member has a residence near the Irene Riverside's Bronzegate Bridge, a lycanthrope, a demon called the Irene's Wild Dog. A dreadian is a demon born with the ability to use the high rank polymorph magic. It's a demon that specializes in transformation magic. Sarkar was the demon who personally kidnapped the Imperial Princess. He excels in transformation magic, stemming from his face change arts, and was able to easily infiltrate the human world. Irene's wild dog leads one of the gangs that runs Guardians under city. Using her excellence in close combat, she was able to create her own force within a short amount of time. With that, she was able to form a massive gang with her at the center and with that, she helped an infiltration squad's funding. Valier asked Elaris about in what way Wild Dog makes money. She earned money through selling gum to people passing by. Valier was shocked on hearing it as basically they were just a bunch of muggers. Elaris again confirmed if he truly had lost his memories, Valier affirmatively answered it yes. She was relieved on hearing it. She proposed to Valier to rebuild the demon world as he is the demon king now. But Valier denied the proposal as he had no interest in rebuilding the demon world. If they rebuild the demon world, there would be another war which might result in the same output as the earlier one did. Although Valier only experienced war once. It was so gruesome that he never wanted to experience something like that again. In this situation, just the act of rallying the demon folk again would be suicide for him. Elaris was astonished on hearing it and asked him how he could say something like that. For the future of demons, he had to rebuild the demon world as the demon king. But for Valier, the demon world was finished. He had no intention of becoming the king of a nation that doesn't even exist. And following that logic, she should also stop acting as the servant of a dead nation. Elaris became sad on hearing it and apologized for her shameful conduct and asked Valier to rest. She went outside the room. But for Valier, she vaguely seemed happy for just a slight moment. Valier laid down on the bed. Elaris sat on a chair and was watching the moon. For Valier, she was like a noble of the moon. Valier asked her what type of person he was in the past. She frighteningly told him that he was great and was the pride of all demons. This made Valier understand that he was definitely not a normal person. They have agreed to meet the other two members of the infiltration squad tomorrow. Valier was sleeping on her only bed, this made him ask her where she will be sleeping. She came and slept with our main protagonist, which embarrassed him. Well, for our novelist, it was a dream come true. Next day, Elaris and Valier went outside to infiltrate. The capital was already happy due to the princess's resurrection, the hero's sacrifice, and the demon king's death. Naturally, they wouldn't stop shouting for joy as the war was finally over. 
Elaris and Valier turned their backs to the cheering crowd to get on the mana train from the Aligar district and then started heading towards the south of the Bronze Gate near the Irene Riverside. They reached the bottom of the Bronze Gate. It was really a bum's nest and was stinking and full of alcoholics. They didn't have another choice as they were going to see the king of those bums, after all. They went to sewers to find the king. She was sitting in front of a lit bonfire and felt a known smell. It was dark, so Elaris warned Valier to be careful of where he was walking. Irene's dog already knew that Valier and Elaris had arrived through smell. Irene's dog's real name was Lawyer. Lawyer bent down on her knees and bowed in front of Valier and called him Your Highness. She was a part of Empire's infiltration squad. Lawyer was a girl, but it was not known to Valier as he was not told about it and neither he wrote that King was a boy in his novel. Sartgar was yet to come as he was a busy noble. Elaris also told Lawyer about Valier losing all memory except for who he is. Lawyer was shocked on hearing it and immediately asked Valier if this was true. Valier nodded his head and told her that it is true. For Lawyer, it was a relief as at least he wouldn't order her to pull her shirt up and be a dog like he used to. Valier was in shock as his previous self used to do something crazy. Elaris laughed while listening to it and asked Lawyer if she secretly liked it. Lawyer was now embarrassed and angry and told Elaris to shut her mouth as she never said something like that. Well, the conclusion from this was that the previous Valier was really trashy. Valier apologized to Lawyer and asked her to be on good terms from now on. It was okay for Lawyer. Valier moved his hand towards Lawyer for a handshake but she instinctively used the dog's palm shake. Valier too asked if this was the way you shake a dog's palm. Lawyer denied it, feeling very embarrassed towards her action. Elaris also mocked her over it. Lawyer apologized to Valier saying that this wasn't her intention. Valier too apologized saying he will be careful next time. Suddenly, they see a man running towards them from the tunnel speaking loudly your highness. The man jumped on Valier and told him that he was scared. The man was Sarkigar. Sarkigar called Valier great and mighty demon prince and requested him to stop the filthy humans. Valier was not able to breathe so told Sarkigar to get off from him. Earlier, Elaris had told Valier that he must be wary of Sarkigar. With absolute loyalty to the demon king, he is more than willing to sacrifice his soul if it's for rebuilding the demon realm. Lawyer immediately took care of Sarkigar and stopped him from making mess. The situation was now in control. All four of them sat surrounding the bonfire. Sarkigar wanted Valier to rebuild the demon realm as it's been destroyed and he must get revenge for the late king. Lawyer again stopped him and warned him if he ever does it again, she will cut his tongue off. For Valier, rebuilding the demon realm was fine but he was a good-for-nothing little kid. According to Sarkigar, Valier is the great and mighty archdemon reigning over all demons but Valier told him to stop and asked what was an archdemon and why was that such a big deal. All three infiltration squad members were astonished on hearing it. Sarkigar was going to answer Valier but Elaris stopped him and answered that the dark land they used to live in was a merciless war zone where the blood never dried. Long ago, the humans started to form nations to change it, but demons were of different races, thus were destroying each other. Until one day, one demon species stopped the never-ending war and united the dark land. They interfered with the minds of the demons and the demons gave them the title of Archdemon out respect. It later went on to become synonymous with the demon king species. Valier now understood why Archdemons were that important and asked what to do next. Sarkigar told him to get stronger and come back to the demon realm and reunite the demons. But that is the worst thing to do as demons just recently lost the war and there's too much risk to do it immediately. They were in the heart of enemy territory, the capital of the empire. And Valier told everyone that he wanted to stay there and learn about humans' culture and their ways to form a strategy. But for Valier, the actual reason is just because of the mana train and human society which is just more convenient for him. 
Sarkigar had an idea which made Valier inquire about it. Sarkigar suggested that he attend the Empire's Educational Institution, Temple. Lawyer too agreed on it. Valier could grow stronger in the temple and bud the seed of revenge in the temple that trains prodigies, like heroes. Valier didn't want to go to the temple and thought that Elaris would save him but to his dismay Elaris also wanted him to go to the temple. Valier thought of a plan and told them it would be dangerous there. His identity might get exposed. But Sarkigar told him not to worry about it and handed him his own ring. With this ring from the Dread Fiend, he'll be able to change his appearance however he wishes. And so, it was decided. He will be going to the temple. Valier was going to use a fake status given to him by either Elaris or Sarkgar. There was also the possibility that there would be an investigation on the victim of Charlotte's kidnapping after the princess's return. And to take measure they changed his identity. Next, Lawyer goes to a tent where she gets Valier to meet his most trusted member, Dai Bun. Dai Bun greets him and asks his name. His new name was now Reinhardt. There was a risk of exposure if he had used the late Demon King's name. So they together decided to name him Reinhardt. Lawyer told Dai Bun to take Valier to get him his ID next day and also to see the temple if they had time to spare. Dai Bun asked Lawyer if she really wanted to take him to the temple. Lawyer answered, they have to raise this little guy and settle down in this life. It was fine for Dai Bun but how she was going to pay for the tuition was a far greater challenge. Lawyer didn't thought of tuition fees. With their current income, they won't be able to afford Temple's tuition fees. Reinhardt too forgot about it as it would be impossible for these beggars to cover one year of Temple's tuition. The Guardia's Temple was the most prestigious educational institution of the continent. It was a place where the children from prestigious families came to study. If failure were to convert the one year's worth of tuition into the currency of the Republic of Korea, where he lived before would amount to at least $100,000. Lawyer again asked Dai Bun if they really cannot cover it with what they earn. Dai Bun replied they could if they reduced the amount she takes from the gang's budget. But it was impossible as she had to meet the expense of the infiltration squad. It was not the choice they could make. Suddenly, Reinhardt raised his hand and requested them to cover the tuition for one semester. Lawyer asked him if he was thinking of going for a scholarship. Reinhardt thought of something similar. Now that the hero had died, the Empire will be looking for the second or third hero, so if one is ascertained to be that talented, they would definitely waive the tuition. In fact, as long as one has an outstanding talent, the temple will waive its tuition. Even if he was the lowest grade demon, he was still an archdemon and was sure as long as he would be trained, he would be able to get at least one talent and thought if worse comes to worse, he could just make a talent bloom by using his achievement points. Lawyer was feeling proud on Reinhardt being confident. But according to Dai Bun, their funds were still insufficient to cover the admission fees. Besides, people also don't visit the Bronzegate Bridge very often which was a reason for the downfall of their revenue. Reinhardt proposed to change their way of thinking which made Dai Bun to ask him about his idea. If the customer were not coming to them, at least they could go to them. He proposed to sell toys on Mana Train as parents would have no choice but to buy them for their kids when they will be whining for them, no matter if they are defective or not. And it was also a place where they could easily run away once any problems arose. Lawyer was about to curse him but stopped midway. Dai Bun praised Reinhardt for his brilliance and told Lawyer that she had a great eye for talent, future seems bright. He also told Reinhardt that he will make sure that he gets into the temple. Reinhardt thought of discipling Lawyer as she was about to curse him, so he moved his one hand forward to shake hands with Lawyer. Lawyer instinctively again used her paw and sat on her knees like a dog which made her furious. Reinhardt gave her an evil smile making her feel he did it on purpose. Dai Bun arranged a party for welcoming Reinhardt as a new family member. For Dai Bun, Reinhardt was a promising member and Valier was going to be drunk for the first time. Everyone enjoyed it and was intoxicated from drinking too much, 
and fell asleep from it except Dai Bun and Reinhardt. Dai Bun offered him a drink on which Reinhardt thanked him. Reinhardt asked Dai Bun for the gang that he mentioned earlier. Dai Bun told him that they were the gang. Reinhardt thought that lawyer was hiding something from him as she makes money with the fairly large organization made through sheer violence, and with it she's able to fund the infiltration team, a magic tool store, and a nobleman and then they are able to manage to support themselves. Out of nowhere lawyer arrives and starts scolding both of them for giving alcohol to Reinhardt. She picked Reinhardt like an item and took him to the interrogation room. Dai Bun felt sorry for him. She questions him about what he would do if he got drunk and messed up, she really couldn't let him out of sight, further she even warned him not to do it again. But Reinhardt was in a serious mood and asked about their another source of income as it must be pretty difficult to cover both the infiltration team's activity funds through selling candies. On listening to which, she was stunned. She didn't tell him earlier because she thought that he didn't need to know it. He further questioned if she was doing something that would harm others. She denied it but it might result in it. Selling candies was just a front. The gang helps the Guardia's Thieves Guild collect information as beggars. And if failure commands it, she would tell him everything however not knowing about it would be better. He can just forget the gang after entering the temple. In the end, if he managed to bloom a talent and get a scholarship, he wouldn't need to get involved with the Rotary Gang for money anymore. He couldn't do anything but to go to sleep without asking more questions, as it seemed like she wouldn't tell him either. Next day, Reinhardt and Dai Bun visited the Imperial Capitals Administration Bureau to get an ID. It was easier than he had thought. Reinhardt found the temple's admissions office and asked if it really was to Dai Bun. According to Dai Bun, this place seems to get bigger every time he comes by. There were many rich people who wanted to send their kids to the temple. If one gets tested over and gets confirmed that he possess an outstanding talent, they could get in without having to pay anything. Everyone there was to get their evaluation done. They both stood up at the registration window. The in charge of this very window welcomed them and told them this is the admission window if they know. Reinhardt told him that they were here to pay the tuition to be admitted to the school. The in-charge replied that there were always people like him who wanted to be admitted with just one semester's worth of tuition. After getting admitted like that, those kids often try to borrow the money for their tuition from other students. To prevent such incidents, they do not allow students to register with only one semester's worth of tuition. On listening to it, Reinhardt wanted to go back as he could not get admitted. But, Dai Bun told him to at least take the test. Dai Bun didn't want him to go back so he told the in-charge that he might be a genius or a supernatural power user, he asked if there was any charge to get examined. It was free to get the examination done. The in-charge felt pity on them and allowed them to do the examination. But for Reinhardt, it was a waste of time. Dai Bun told him not to be discouraged. They would do everything they could to get him admitted. She took out the scanner and asked Reinhardt to put his hands on the scanner. He feared that they might discover that he was an archdemon because of demon domination. But he had a plan, if he got caught, he would make the use of the ring right away. He did the test but the in-charge could not believe the result and apologized as it seemed to be broken and started to change it. This made Daibon question Reinhardt if he actually had something. Reinhardt brushed him off. He didn't think that they discovered he was a demon. She just said that she was going to change the crystal ball after all. And to begin with, he knew his stats better than anyone else. The in-charge got them a new crystal and checked its functionality and so, it was going to work. He put his hand on the crystal but the results were astonishing to the in-charge which made Dai Bun ask if it was broken again. But, she was sure the tool was working normally as she just recently checked it. She asked him to hold it for a second time. She couldn't believe the result she had on her screen. This made Dai Bun ask her for the matter. She answered aptitudes. Aptitudes were an inferior version of talents. 
They aren't enough to call someone an overwhelming genius but it shows that one will have good results if one works hard in that direction. However, while one can't enter the school with aptitudes alone, they still told the children their aptitudes during counseling as a form of service but however, according to the examination's result, Reinhardt was born with an aptitude for everything in this world. He could use both holy and dark magic. There's never been someone like him in the history of the empire. Dai Bun was very happy to learn Reinhardt had infinite aptitude. He playfully hit Reinhardt which left a mark on his back. Now, Reinhardt would be going to the temple. It was a relief for Dai Bun. But it was not something Reinhardt was aiming for. Later, Dai Bun told lawyer about everything and was shocked on hearing about Reinhardt's infinite aptitude. Dai Bun got carried away as he thought they now had a real future elite among their ranks but lawyer hit him and told him to shut. She became happy as everything went according to the plan. Reinhardt wondered if infinite aptitude was something needed for the story to make sense. He could go any route he wanted with his achievement points. He could specialize in close combat with weapons or in magic or even in archery, not only that he could get any talent he wanted if he had sufficient achievement points. That might be the reason he was given aptitude in every field. Reinhardt didn't seem happy to die Bun but Reinhardt replied he was happy as now he won't be a burden to the club. Dai Bun praised himself for it as Reinhardt wouldn't even know his own abilities if it weren't for him and he should be grateful to him. The original story was catching on. Earlier, Reinhardt was planning to join the main story next semester but at this rate, he will be put into the royal class immediately. The royal class is a special class within the temple, an elite class where all students receive permanent scholarships. Students of royal class have their own extravagant dormitories and plenty of financial support. They are the genius students who can take any class without restrictions, the greatest talents of the empire. Reinhardt was originally planning to stay as a normal student for a semester and try to farm some achievement points but they directly put him into the class A, the royal class. Later, he went to meet Elleris and told him about his placement in the A class. According to her, Class A was the most elite class, even among the royal classes. Reinhardt became worried as Class A will probably be dunked on by the main character from his novel. The main character of novel, The Demon King is Dead, Ludwig, is a transfer student in Class 1B. He stands up to the A class that taunts the B class for being inferior, and forms friendships with his classmates in Class A as he advances in his journey. Being infinite aptitude, Reinhardt felt pressured. Elleris consolidates him by saying he would do well. Reinhardt can already picture the villains he will be meeting in Class A and he won't be able to survive with just aptitude if something happens. Elleris will also help him to their best efforts in her own ways. She asked if the temple allows leave to the students on which Reinhardt answered affirmatively saying yes but he also questions her why she wants to send him to the temple so much. If he do become really powerful like Sarkgar wants, what will happen if he changes his mind and starts a new war? But Elleris believed that if he spends enough time with humans, he would come to love humans as well. And she would deal with those problems when they get to them. She prepared some clothes for him as he needed more clothes than just uniform. And she also gave him her magical necklace. She tells him if he remembers that she referred to herself as Tuesday when they met. Long time ago, there were seven vampire clans called the Seven Knights. The clans of Monday and Sunday disappeared long ago, so their magic has long been forgotten. But the other five clans have specialized in the elements corresponding to their name, and have passed it down from generation to generation. What she gave him was the treasure of her clan, the symbol of her clan's leader, the Flame of Tuesday. Reinhardt deduces that she was the clan head of the Tuesday clan and asked her why she was giving something so important to him. She told him just as the ring that Sarkgar gave him houses the power of the Dread Fiends. And this necklace allows one to use as much fire magic as his magic reserve allows. She asked him to try it for once. He casted fire magic but it was very weak as like he was using a flint fire starter. He questioned the reason for it. 
she replied that it was an item that had more power the more negatively one fell towards someone and hoped to Reinhardt to not get too used to the flame of Tuesday. And also this would make him understand the reason she gave it to him. It's because as much as she doesn't want him to hurt someone else but she's also just as worried about his safety. He wore the locket and thanked Elleris for the same. And also told her that he will aim not to use the necklace until his graduation, on listening to it, Elleris became happy and thanked him. Later he went to lawyer, where she gave him a bag full of coins. Earlier it was going to be his tuition, but as he now had the scholarship, he could just use it as he wishes. Unlike the others, all she could offer was money. Reinhardt thanked her and told her that he would use it wisely. She told him to sleep early tonight and started giving a lecture which made Reinhardt furious as he was not a kid and told her to go to bed too. On his way, he remembered a crucial problem. The story, The Demon King is Dead, was a slice-of-life story. It was a nice, relaxing story he wrote to satiate his fans, who were tired of his dark and tragic endings. However, he didn't have the talent to finish a happy story to its end. He had run out of the material to write about rather quickly, and the story lost its purpose. So, he killed each character. In the middle of the story, a gate connected to another world opens, and from which thousands of monsters pour out. And the world would fall under the threat of complete annihilation. He would now be screwed from his upcoming tragic events. He wanted to do everything to stop the calamity as why should everyone pay the price for his stupid actions. He was the cause of this mess which would happen after some time. He needed to take the responsibility. Now, he needed to go to the temple to grow stronger and collect achievement points. After that, he have to use revision to either stop the gate from opening, or personally fight the monsters. Whether it was world destruction or something else, he needs to do something about it. Later, he went to the academy where he heard the announcements for new students to have student ID and acceptance letter ready. And also new students of the royal class have to be present as the dormitory lobby by 1 p.m. He was astonished to see the temple gate again, he didn't think his lazy settings would be materialized like it. He mumbled about how much money they put on all of this building. The inside was even fancier. His main problem was to find his own room in a place so big. Suddenly he is called by a girl. She asked him if he was the new student of the royal class. After Reinhardt's affirmative answer, she began to introduce herself. She was Ceres Van Owen, the class president of the royal class. She asked if he was looking for his room. She could help him but first she had to look over his ID Reinhardt gave her his ID. After looking through it she inquired about not having a last name and being part of class A. He was assigned room A-11. To reach there, he needed to head towards the Class A lobby. She also again told him about the announcement that there would be a freshman welcome party at 1 p.m. in the lobby. Attendance will be mandatory since they will be informing him of the rules that first years have to follow. Reinhardt thanked her for her help and started to find his room. He found his room A-11 in the same direction he was told by the girl. He was also told how to use his student ID card for opening the room. There was some type of magic which would unlock the door if the particular student ID would be shown to it. On getting inside of his room, he wondered what his room would be like as he didn't remember writing it as a small space in his novel. He was shocked when he saw the room for the first time. It was very fascinating and extravagant and bigger than he imagined and could not believe it was a student dorm. He found a welcome gift on the floor and started to open it. It consisted of a map of temple, dorm rules, simple snacks, a notepad, and a pen. He had some time left for the welcome party, so he decided to remember every character he would see in the temple. After writing about Class A students and some of Class B, he heard the announcement to gather at the central lobby for the welcome party. He remembered only a few characters clearly, but it should be a good rough organization of who they all were. After reaching the party, he could only recognize a handful of them even after his preparation. 
He also found upperclassmen of the royal class standing on the balcony keeping an eye on new students. They looked terrifying because of their glares and he deduced that they came to check the new students out. A boy was standing in front of Reinhardt. He moved back and accidentally stepped on Reinhardt's leg. The boy apologized while Reinhardt told him to move only after checking if someone was behind him. He again apologized and asked if Reinhardt was hurt. He was sorry for stepping on his foot and asked if he could stand up. The boy introduced himself as Ludwig and asked Reinhardt about his identity. Reinhardt too introduced himself. Ludwig hoped to get along with him. The welcome party was starting. Seeing the protagonist, it was finally hitting Reinhardt that he was inside his novel. Suddenly the speaker in the party welcomed all the freshmen and told them to walk to the chairs prepared in the center of the lobby. According to Reinhardt, Class B should have had 10 people but he saw 11 people now. All the freshmen were asked to take a seat when they were in front of their chairs. Reinhardt wondered if they matched the numbers because he ended up being especially admitted. Reinhardt was 11th student of Class A and Class B now also has 11 students. He was last in Class A and immediately thought how he would be treated. He was certain that's what's going to happen. This was a perfect setup for that. All the students were asked to do self-introduction and started with number A, 1. Number A, 1 was Bertus de Guardias. This shocked Reinhardt as originally, he was supposed to be admitted under a fake identity. Further, all the students introduced themselves. Now it was the turn of our protagonist. His number was A11. All the students started gossiping about him having infinite aptitude and how he was allowed in the royal class with merely an aptitude. They had never seen anyone like him. He was very embarrassed after listening to them. Now, it was the turn of class B. The speaker asked to start introducing themselves from B, 1. The number B, 1 was Charlotte de Guardias. This shocked Reinhardt as she wasn't supposed to be there. The structures of outside power did not apply within the temple, which means that not even the royal family can get in unless they prove their talent and skill. If Bertus, the first prince, graduates with excellent grades, that alone would grant him immense power. He was the hidden villain of the demon king is dead and entering into the temple was the first step to turn his ambition into reality. But the plot changed because Reinhardt rescued the imperial princess, and now both the prince and princess were in line for becoming the king. Originally Bertus had kept his identity hidden, but he revealed it from the beginning this time. Bertus in the novel awakens three talents after Duke Salarian poured money into him. Reinhardt wondered if both the prince and princess are in the royal class but she is in class B as B1. The reason to this might be that the school faculty felt cautious as it would be troublesome if both the prince and princess were in the same class. The scene shifts to the speaker. They were done with the introduction and now it was the time for the royal class rules. In the royal class and also in the temple, everyone was on equal grounds unless it's the differentiation between the upper and lower classes. Where one is from a noble of high degree or even of royal descent, it's all the same. She warned if one still creates tension with his or her status inside the temple, there would be an immediate warning from the president of the student council and if the warnings accumulate, there would be a faculty meeting and after that, disciplinary action would be decided and he or she would get ready for expulsion. Also they had received a letter from the Guardia's royal palace. Normally it wouldn't be allowed but since it was special she started to read it. It consisted of the warning that if Charlotte or Bertus are harmed in any way, regardless of how minor, the other party would be permanently deprived of their right to the throne. Reinhardt deduced that it wasn't just directed to Bertus or Charlotte, but to their followers both in and out of the temple. So because of this, they won't be fighting each other for the time being. The scene shifts to Eric de la Ferry. A student A9 talking to Bertus. He treated Bertus as an imperial prince but Bertus told him to treat him equally according to rules. Reinhardt, watching it from afar, already deduced that he was taming him with words alone. Suddenly, Ellen, A2 passes by and is immediately stopped by Bertus. 
He apologized to her for taking her place, and as she should have been a one, but the administration was being a bit overly cautious. But it was all fine for her, as she never cared much about stuff like that. Reinhardt already knew all about it. Originally she was A1 in the royal class, but she got pushed back to A2 by Burtis. She was a genius with the revenge talent almost too good to even be A1 but she keeps it a secret. Her real surname was Artorias. She was Regan Artorias's little sister, the hero who took down the demon king by sacrificing himself. Next, Ludwig arrives on the scene and greets everyone but to his dismay no one even responds to him. From the novel, the first event already had started as the main character got a mark on his back for senselessly talking to an A-class. Ludwig became embarrassed but on seeing Reinhardt, he moved to him. Our protagonist, unlike others, greeted him properly as he wanted to be on good terms with the upcoming hero. But Harriet de St. Owen sitting on a chair clearly despised Ludwig. Ludwig went to her and greeted her. He knew she was A4 but didn't remember her name, so he asked her about her name on which she told him to move back as they were in Class A dorms. She feels annoyed because of his actions as he was from Class B. Suddenly, Berta steps in and stops her. Harriet was now terrified on seeing Berta stepping in. She tried making excuses but soon Burtis and Ludwig moved out of there. She was now depressed as she had to look good for the prince. Her talent was magic and she was the daughter of Duke St. Owen. On their way, Burtis introduced himself to Ludwig and apologized on behalf of her and told him that there were some sensitive friends who thought much about their status. He further told him to feel free to use the beeper if he had something to say and he would teach him if he didn't know about using it. Suddenly, a notice popped up in front of Reinhardt. He had completed the first day at Temple Achievement, and had earned 100 achievement points from it. He was surprised that he earned 100 points just because he listened to Ludwig being told off. He opened the shop to find he could purchase the skills, but had only 800 points. He then opened the subsections which were supernatural abilities. He wanted to use magic and was happy as they were in reach now. Supernatural abilities are extremely weak when they first start manifesting and they are hard to control and need repetitive training. Reinhardt decided to gather more achievement points before buying a supernatural ability. Although the royal class entrance ceremony was held separately, the procedure was very simple. The head teacher introduced them to the homeroom teacher for each class and then they were led to the private class building near the dorms. For Reinhardt, there wasn't much to the entrance ceremony which meant that even with the prince and princess, nothing changed. Suddenly, he was told to focus on the class by the Class A's homeroom teacher. He was Mr. Eppenhauser, Class A's homeroom teacher. He then told them about the schedule. They had a common class in that room on Mondays and Thursdays. On Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they would be taking each of his or her pre-registered classes. The teacher made a one, Bertus the temporary leader, and told everyone that class management and suggestions should be reported through the leader. Teacher further told them that if they wanted to replace the leader, they should discuss and report it to him after deciding and anything the students needed to hear from the teacher would be communicated through a one. However, there was an exception. Teacher told them to call him immediately if a big fight broke out. Teachers prevents the students from killing each other to the best of their ability, but that was limited to what they could see and further told them to be careful of each other and to check what talents their classmates had later. One of the students asked the teacher about what would happen if they needed to interfere. The teacher told them that the students were subject to special management. While each one is valuable individuals to the empire, Still they were also dangerous and could be a threat to others. Teacher further questions him if they weren't warned upon entering the temple, which means as the instructor of the royal class, he was permitted to immediately punish students subjected to such special management. On listening to it, all the students were shocked. But again one student asked if he was capable of doing so, to which the teacher replied that he had been doing that for the last ten years. After all the discussion, Teacher hoped all the students would understand what he meant when he said to be careful. 
All of the students were now hopeless from the murderous intent of the teacher. After going through the all files, teacher found A11 to be odd and asked him to follow him to the staff room. After being suddenly called, Reinhardt became hopeless and didn't know what to do. He followed the teacher. Teacher told him that his potential was infinite from infinite aptitude but still he didn't have a talent yet. Teacher further provided him with the information of other students. Grants A3 has a supernatural ability while Cliff Mann A5 has a combat talent. Grants would take meditation and supernatural ability control classes and Cliff Mann would take classes related to close combat. In other words, his classmates had specific abilities and paths Reinhardt already knew about it. Further, the teacher questioned him that he didn't know what to study even when he had aptitude in all fields but didn't have anything special. Reinhardt was now at ease as the teacher was trying to help. It was possible for someone's aptitude and talent to differ from what they actually wanted to do. Teacher had seen plenty of those. And compared to them, Reinhardt was better since he could do what he wanted to. Reinhardt now confidently told the teacher that he wanted to learn a supernatural ability. Teacher was surprised by his answer but further questioned him if supernatural abilities were included in his many aptitudes. It was infinite aptitude so it was possible. Reinhardt said it because supernatural abilities were cheap but the teacher's reaction didn't look too good to him. Teacher told him that if they were going by the rules, someone without supernatural abilities wouldn't be able to attend the class. But it was a bit different in the case of the royal class. But he could get kicked out if he proves unable to do anything. Then the teacher ordered him to attend one lesson and handed him the class schedule for him. It was difficult to manifest a supernatural ability with effort. So the teacher told him to try to find other interests besides supernatural abilities. For Reinhardt, he was a better teacher than he thought he'd be. On entering the class, he was confronted by his classmates, to which he thought what they were all doing or if he had something on his face. One of the students asked him if he really didn't have any talent and laughed. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for the next part.